to talk about something interesting. Do you remember the Brady Bunch? I mean, chances are you're not 65 years old, so probably not. So let's go with the Saiyaman saga in Dragon Ball Z. Leave me out of this. Do you remember how it completely had nothing to do with any of the... <sighs> and more to do with Gohan skipping classes to go be Batman? Why was it so unusual in the context of Dragon Ball Z? Instead of intergalactic world-ending power struggles, it was about two dumb teenagers acting out superhero tropes and falling in love. It broke the scope. Well, so too did the movie A Very Brady Sequel famously feature a smexy scene where Marsha and Greg share a bedroom together, and it insinuates some things. It's so memorable and effective as a parody because implying anything to do with sexual thoughts would be absolute anathema to your grandparents who were watching Brady Bunch back on the radio in 1895. And all of this is like very duh, right? Dragon Ball Z proper and the Brady Bunch both consciously and deliberately have a definitive and established set of rules by which they play. A scope of things that the story dwells on and other things that it forgets. They avoid changing the tone or the character of the series lest they make the viewer feel cheated or confused. And all good media is like this. In a word, consistent. That is, until it isn't. A break in the scope when used with purposeful and skillful intent can make for astonishingly memorable moments, like Kion getting stabbed or Krahi addressing Drosselmeyer directly. And as an informed and cultured anime fan, I'm sure you remember that time Arya did it. That's right, the Trigetto episode. Consider the extremely well-defined scope of Arya, the animation, natural, and origination up until this point late in the series. Until now, it's a series that revels again and again in the superhuman grace of Alicia when Athena sings both characters in the show and the show itself stop and they listen. Mundanity and serious problems gradually and effectively vanish into the soft, sweet, optimistic serenity that is Neo-Venezia. It's that type of show. And it has quite consistently been that type of show for about 45 episodes until this point. With that context in our minds and our hearts, in one of my favorite scenes of all time, in the show that defined the healing genre of anime, is this character blaming other people? While it's not the first negative emotion, it is completely beyond the scope and previous content of this small slice of life series. Aika cried because she had to cut her hair. Alice was too upset that people wanted to help her. But this? This moment feels serious on another, hereto unseen, level. And it is. Bomb dropped. While every trial faced by our heroine so far has been external or trivial, here we see some serious corruption of the spirit from within. A tour is going all Sayaka. But take a long moment to admire the execution of this scene. Look at the shot composition. How far Atora is from the other three in a purely physical sense. How she's standing, leaning forward, as if to challenge them to disagree. How none of the arrest are standing. And then we have the reaction shots of each character. An extended silence. She may have well just yelled a racist slur at the top of her lungs. So people struggle in this world? And this is why I love this moment. You had no idea. You may have thought somewhere along the line about the situation of the gondoliers, how they make money, what hours they work, what does being a water fairy even mean? What happens when they need to pee when on the gondola? Wouldn't they get sunburned from being in the sun all day? But the second you begin to wonder about the logistics, the series is there with art and music and pacing to whisk your stupid wand mind away to a land of enchantment and to firmly redirect your focus onto the idyllic everyday experiences of Akari and her friends. You had no idea that hardship like this was even a thing. Why? Because Arya didn't let you think about it. There was never a shot of money nor mention of the economy before this episode. There was never another Undine outside of the Water Fairies and their apprentices that was even given a name before this episode. There was never a metric for Akari's skill, and there was never a failure state before this scene. So in this moment, I, the viewer, like the other three girls on that gondola, am shocked. 
I wonder what rules is this world playing by? Are things about to get dark? Have I been lied to? No, of course not. Grace. This series of shots is amazing. We see Anzu literally stand up for herself, taking agency, gather everyone's attention. She looks down at no one in particular as the camera zooms in, signaling intimacy, introspection. The negative emotions are stated with the camera behind a tourist's shoulder. That's the direction, of course, that they originated from earlier. But then a low shot on the other two, where you think you're supposed to be focusing on Ayumi, but the words don't match their personalities. Then you realize what you should have been looking at was Anzu's clenched hands, by which unclenching symbolize the release and herald the triumph of grace. Immediately after that shot, bubbles rising up, like the forthcoming hope speech from deep inside Anzu, but also establishing a growing metaphor between the water, aqua of course, the name of the planet, and how it supports Anzu and all the Undines. And if you didn't see this coming, you need to check your epiphany detector sensors. When's the last time you saw a character breathe in an animated work? Go on, think about it. I'll wait. It really shows how much effort this speech is taking on Anzu, keeps the pacing slow, and makes us empathically connect with the vulnerable character doing something staggering, all without even saying one word. It's mind-blowing in its brevity. And then, of course, the shot to end all shots. When she talks about potential and aspiration, the shot shifts to a low angle, viewing a star in the sky, as if she grows from the water upwards to infinity. Visually, she's supported by the water, the boat, balanced on both sides by the overwhelming pressures on her right and the voice of grace on her left. She's not yet at the level of the star, but again, through the slow lowering of the camera angle, she is literally reaching and growing towards it. Cut out the eyes, cross the arms, and frown. That's a standard animation fare, right? But at Akari's line of assurance, there's an immediate and harsh pan up. It took literally one line and half a second for Akari to completely undo the downtrodden visual representation of a Torah to make her beautiful again. And now, from a Torah's point of view, to show how she's absorbing all this, and right before and right after the drama is resolved, we get the payoff here, the Arya faces. This is incredibly important to the viewer, and it's such a staple of the show by this point. It feels like a touchstone offered up to the invested viewer as if an admission. First, it's only Akari's, right? Then everyone's on the beat when Anzu returns to the boat. Now we see them used again liberally with a cheery tone. Yes says Arya. Yes, we made you care about these episodic characters, and now you can truly identify them as Undines by the established language of this show. Now know that their emotional drama is every bit as poignant as anything you've seen in this series and for the other cast members. And this, this is the way Arya, the origination, leveraged its forcefully and tactfully crafted serenity along with its oh so tiny limited scope as sacrosanct bait. With this scene, Arya shocked me. It performed a micro deconstruction of itself in just one episode and simultaneously expanded and naturalized the world it strived so hard to build. But hey, don't take my word for it. Take legendary series director Junichi Sato's. <笑>伝説第二話ですね。いきなり豪速球が来たってやつですね。急所ね、井上さんの豪速球は。そうなんですよ。だからね、ネオベネチアの空気とかいろいろその世界観分かってもらって、4話でえ、ちょっとこう格